Welcome to EPG Patshala in Computer Science. This is a series of lectures in, com in computer networks. So, we have been looking at the protocols that are used in wired networks. Starting from today, we will be looking at wireless networks. So, we will look at different protocols that are used in the wireless world. Now, the importance of wireless networks need not be emphasized. We all know that we all have many more mobile devices, many more wireless devices rather than the wired devices. The number of wired devices and cell phones and the wireless devices, cell phones, laptops and other things are increasing. So, we are all very much aware of that. So, definitely there is a necessity to learn and to know how these are integrated into the wired network, into the network as a whole. So, to start with we will take a look at the different characteristics of wireless networks and then we will look at some of the standards for wireless networks. In this module we will cover Wi-Fi which is the LAN standard, which is the wireless LAN standard which goes by the name of IEEE 802.11. So, we will look at the details of that particular protocol. Okay. So, when we talk of wireless links, we know that wireless links transmit electromagnetic signals. It could be radio frequency signals or microwave signals or infrared signals. So, these are different possibilities that we have. And wireless links typically are all, uh, they share the same media, right. So, that is the, uh, it is a broadcast media that is used. So, everybody has to share that same media. So, the major challenge that we have when we talk of wireless networks is how efficiently we are able to share this media without having some undue interference between one another, okay. So, that the different devices which are transmitting do not interfere with one another. So, we need to figure out mechanisms by which that interference can be minimized. Normally, the sharing is accomplished by dividing the media either along the dimensions of frequency or space, okay. This is typically what we do. And of course, time also is another factor. So, we could do either time division multiplexing or frequency division multiplexing or space division multiplexing in order to um, share the available uh, media, okay. And normally what happens is that when we have exclusive use of a particular frequency in a particular geographic area, um, that is allotted to an individual entity or a, a corporation that is done normally by means of some government agency. So, we normally have a lot of regulatory um, factors that need to be taken into account in terms of what kind of frequencies are allocated for different users or different technologies to use the radio frequencies available as such, okay. So, there are uh, some, for instance, there are some special bands are reserved for certain purposes or certain uses. So, you cannot use those for other purposes. So, this, so, so we can, we need to be aware of this, of this uh, space that is available of the different spectrum that is available and how the spectrum actually gets shared by, for different purposes by different users. So, that is just an overview of what we need to remember about wireless uh, links and we are familiar with most of these points that we just talked about. Okay. So, now if you look at the elements of a wireless network, this is also something that you would be very much familiar with. So, uh, if you look at the devices that we have, we have wireless hosts. So, wireless hosts could be laptop, smartphones and they would typically be running applications. They may be stationary or mobile. Now, remember that wireless does not always mean mobility. It could be a stationary device just connected by means of a wireless uh, connection, okay. That is a possibility. So, we have wireless hosts and we always have some kind of central devices which are, which go, normally go by the name of base station. So, typically these base stations would be connected to a wired network. So, they are responsible for sending packets between the wired network and the wireless network, okay. So, they will have a responsibility for a particular area. So, they are responsible for taking packets to there in that their area to the wired network. So, for example, your cell towers, your 802.11 access points, depending on what kind of wireless technology we have, there are different names that are given to these uh, central or these um, infrastructure kind of uh, um, devices that we have. So, they take the responsibility of connecting up the wired world and the wireless world. Okay. Then of course, we have wireless links. So, these wireless links are the ones which are used to connect the mobile devices to the base stations. So, they can also be used as a backbone link and normally we have some kind of a multiple access protocol that is used to coordinate access to the links and uh, it could be uh, supporting various data rates depending on various factors, transmission distance and so on, okay. So, that again would depend on what kind of links are used and their characteristics. And there are normally two modes of operation that we normally talk about when we talk of wireless networks. One is called as an infrastructure mode of operation and the other is called as an ad hoc mode of operation. So, when we talk of infrastructure mode, we typically are looking at a situation where there is a base station which connects the mo mobiles into a wired network, okay. So, you could have some kind of handoff mecha mechanisms which are used when a mobile uh, changes base station, it goes from one base station to another, you know, and you will still be able to maintain the connectivity with the 
rest of the network. So, that is um, facilitated by means of the base station. So, we, need, we have some infrastructure, some uh, specific devices which are responsible for providing the connectivity and for providing the routing functions and so on. So, that is what we mean by an infrastructure mode of operation. So, when we talk of an ad hoc mode of operation, here there are no base stations. So, there is no specific infrastructure available as such. So, which means the nodes can just transmit to each other when they are within the uh, coverage region of one another or the nodes themselves must organize themselves into some kind of a network and they should take responsibility of routing packets among themselves. So, which means a node will act not just as an end node, but also as a router. So, this is called as the ad hoc mode and we talk about networks that are formed in such a manner as ad hoc networks. So, we talk about mobile ad hoc networks and so on. So, these are the two different modes in which wireless networks could be set up. Okay. Now, if you look at the common wireless technologies that are used depending on the range that is covered, depending on the data rates that they cover and so on, there are many different technologies that are used. So, we will look at three distinct um, categories. So, we have the Bluetooth uh, wireless technology uh, which is used typically for short ranges, typically within about 10 meters distance. Data rates that are supported are 2 megabit per second. Typical use is for um, to link a peripheral to a computer okay. and the wired technology analogy for this would be something like a USB. Okay. Then we have Wi-Fi which is a wireless LAN. So, here the, um, the coverage is much larger up to 100 meters can be covered and data rates are about 54 megabit per second shared and this is used to link a computer to a wired base. The, again the wired analogy for this would be uh, Ethernet. So, in, then you have 3G cellular uh, or 4G or whatever cellular technology as such. So, this is used for a much larger coverage tens of kilometers and hundreds of kilobits per second per uh, connection and now if you talk of 4G and so on it is all in terms of megabits and hundreds of megabits and gigabits and that is the kind of um, connect uh, data rates that you can support. So, these are normally used to link a mobile phone to a wired tower okay and a wired technology analogy for this would be DSL okay. So, this is uh, these are different technologies that we have. So, what we will actually be doing is we will take uh, each of these and we will be looking at each of these in detail. So, we will look at the Wi-Fi uh, specifically in this particular uh, module. Okay. So, uh, in general this is again placing the same wireless link characteristics on a um, in a comparative scale. So, you can see that indoor 10 to 30 meters typically we have different uh, protocols that are used for that range. You have 802.15 which is a Zigbee protocol then you have 802.11 n a g b and so on and you can see that they support different data rates. Um, similarly for wireless and I mean for um, cellular technologies we have CDMA, GSM, 2G, 2.5G, 3G, 4G and so on. You can see that here you can see that as we go from one generation to another generation the data rate that is supported is increasing and you are able to support much larger distances. So, you can go from outdoor from 50 to 200 meters to mid range to long range okay up to 20 kilometers can be supported using these. So, these are uh, the different wireless um, technologies that are that we have today and there are a lot more that are coming up okay. So, as the uh, technology advances we find that new standards are coming and we have new applications which, which demand a higher and higher data rate. So, it is kind of a very positive feedback which kind of pushes the whole thing further and further okay. So, now um, coming to the normal characteristics or in a, in a sense challenges that we need to face when we talk about wireless links. Okay, we need to understand the major differences from the wired link. See one of the uh, important difference is that the decrease in the signal strength that is when a radio signal as it propagates and as the distance increases it attenuates as it propagates through the matter right. So, there will be something what we call as a path loss that is there is a loss along the path. Now, this need of course, there may be some attenuation in wired networks as well, but in the case of um, radio signals it is much more um, accentuated. Now, you can also have interference from other sources. So, we know that standardized there are standardized wireless network frequencies for instance 2.4 gigahertz is shared by other devices as well. So, uh, phones for instance devices uh, for instance some motors they all have the same frequencies though these could interfere with the transmission at a particular uh, frequency band. So, another problem that we face when we talk about wireless uh, transmission is the multi path propagation uh, issue. So, basically what happens when you send the, uh, when you when you have radio signals that are transmitted these radio signals can reflect off various surfaces they could reflect off the objects on the ground ok. So, which means it could um, so you these reflected signals would appear at the destination at slightly different times so, which means that when they 
um, the same signal reflected by different objects when it when it appears at a particular at the destination when all of them put together it looks like it's a it's a noisy signal right you have a lot of interference because of these uh, reflected waves that are coming in so that is something that we need to handle okay so all these put together they make communication even for a point to point wireless link much more difficult okay so that's the challenge that we are um, that we need to handle okay so another important aspect that is the signal to noise ratio so now uh, signal to noise ratio remember larger the signal to noise ratio it is easier to extract the uh, signal from the noise okay is a good thing so and if you look at how signal to noise ratio um, varies and what is the effect of signal to noise ratio as it is the bit error rate now given a particular physical layer okay if you increase the power okay you would be able to increase the signal to noise ratio because you are when you say increase the power of the signal obviously the snr will increase and when you increase the snr you would be able to decrease the bit error rate okay so the which is also a good thing so but we need to increase power so that becomes one of the issues that we need to consider and so given a particular snr signal to noise ratio another option that you could have is that you can choose a physical layer that meets that particular bit error requirement which gives the highest throughput so for instance if you look at what we have here you can see that as the uh, this is uh, for bpsk for instance bpsk as the snr increases you can see that the bit error rate right also increases so you can see that um that you get a be much better a bit error uh, rate as you bit error rate decreases right because one in 10 power minus 2 when your snr is low but when your snr goes towards 10 you can see that the bit error rate becomes about 10 power minus 7 so which is much less of bit error bit errors that are occurring so as the snr increases you can see that you have um, change in the bit error rates so what we could do is if i have a particular snr that i am allowed to use i can choose the appropriate um, physical layer technology i can use qam256 or qam16 or bpsk depending on what snr is available for me in order to meet a particular bit error rate requirement because in some cases you may be able to work with higher bit error rates in some case you need a lower bit error rate so you need to uh, choose the snr and choose the physical layer ap appropriately okay that's important and what's also important to remember is that the snr may change with mobility so which means we need to be able to dynamically adapt the physical layer as as you move on the move you must be able to adapt these things so the modulation technique the rate these things you must be able to change in order to take care of these things right so that's um, another challenge that we have so in general if you look at the network characteristics now we talked about link characteristics now when you look at a wireless network characteristic what we find is that there's an additional challenge that comes just because of the fact that we have multiple wireless senders and receivers which are transmitting data okay so when you have multiple access right so that causes additional problems one of the very um, common problems that we talk about is the hidden terminal problem so this is a situation where for instance you have these three nodes b a b and c so let's say b and a can hear each other b and c can hear each other okay but a and c cannot hear each other which means if c is transmitting to b a will be unaware of it and a transmitting to b c is unaware of it so what could happen therefore is if a and c simultaneously transmit to b being unaware of the fact that somebody else is already transmitting the data so, so naturally there will be interference at b so this is something that we need to avoid so we say that a and c are hidden with respect to each other so we have a hidden terminal problem okay so uh, similar i mean this again this is accentuated by the fact that you have signal attenuation so this uh, the same thing ha could happen because of the signal attenuation so a signal strength for instance is such that when it goes to b it uh, b can hear it whereas by the time it goes to c the signal strength is so low c cannot hear it so same thing happens with respect to c c's signal strength is is uh, decipherable at b but it's too low at a so naturally what happens a and c cannot hear each other and that causes the um, interference at b right so it could so this hidden terminal problem occurs because of these kind of reasons so this again is a problem that we need to handle so this is causing an interference this interference will have to be handled okay so now we will look at the um, 8 IEEE 802.11 wireless lan protocol and see how these different problems are handled by this particular standard okay so if you look at the 802.11 standard there are multiple um, versions or sh so to say of this particular protocol you have the 802.11b um, which basically operates in the 2.4 to 5 gigahertz unlicensed spectrum you get data rates of up to 11 megabit per second it uses Uh, what is called as direct sequence spread spectrum at the physical layer okay and where different hosts use the same 
chipping code in order to transmit the their data. Then we have 802.11a which works in the 5 to 6 gigahertz range. You can have up to 54 megabit per second data rates. 802.11g 2.4 to 5 gigahertz range up to 54 meg megabit per second and then 802.11n where you have use multiple antenna and therefore you can have up to 200 megabit per second and so on. Now all of them use a particular technique called CSMA CA for multiple access and all of them support both the infrastructure mode of operation, this is a base station mode of operation and an ad hoc mode of operation that we mentioned, right. So this is basically, so we will, we need to understand what the CSMA CA is, that is the key um, multiple access protocol that is used in 802.11, we will look at that shortly, okay. So if you look at the 802.11 wireless LAN topology, so it basically looks like this, you have access points, so these access points are connected to various um, mobile stations. And this access point along with the mobile station that it connects to are referred to as the basic service set, okay. So you could have one basic service set here, another basic service set here and these access points should be connected by means of what is called as a distribution system. So this distribution system could be any type of LAN for instance. So you could also have an access point which is not connected to a distribution system which is just connected to a set of nodes, an independent basic service set as such. So this would form an ad hoc network. So you have an infrastructure based network here and you have a, a ad hoc network that is that is available here. So you could have both modes of operation that are supported by 802.11. Okay. Right. So if you look at the uh, protocol layers, how the uh, 802.11 protocol layers work. So at the physical layer, 802.11 can work with various physical layer technologies. It could be frequency hopping spread spectrum which is used or direct sequence spread spectrum or it could use IR, infrared or OFDM which is orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. So all these are different physical layer technologies that are supported. We are now more worried about the MAC uh, layer. So it has a 802.11 MAC layer and it has a 802.2 LLC, logical link control layer that is supported. So this is, these are the layers that we need to understand about 802.11. Okay. So if you look at the uh, wireless LAN evolution in terms of speed and functionality, so initially your 1 and 2 megabit per second was supported using IR, DSSS and FHSS and then later it is moved up from 5.5 to 11 megabit per second and all the way up to 300 megabit per second, okay. So this is possible in 11N with uh, multiple input, multiple output, OFDM kind of uh, uh, physical layer technologies that are supported. And in terms of functionality, we also have improvements that have happened with the uh, evolution. So for instance, 802.11E supports quality of service, 802.11I has enhanced security features. 802.11s uh, supports mesh and 11k and 11r support roaming um, and measures and handoff features that are supported, okay. So these are um, the evolution that has happened on the wireless LAN uh, 802.11 related protocols, okay. So now coming back to understanding the uh, functions of this 802.11 architecture. So as we said you have base stations or um, basic service sets uh, which are connected to a base station nodes that is nodes which belong to a particular um, area which are connected to a single base station or an access point, they form the basic service set. So these basic service sets could be connected as we said by means of any network. It could be a hub or a switch or a router also which connects it to the internet. So this is uh, what you would have. So in infrastructure mode of operation as we saw, you would have wireless hosts and an access point. If it was an ad hoc mode, it will only have hosts. So that is something that we already saw. Now one of the important aspects that we need to understand here is the first thing that we need to understand so to say is how is it that you have um, the association of the nodes with the access points taking place, okay. That is something we need to understand and we need to understand what channels will be available for these um, nodes to be able to associate with the access points. So if you look at 802.11b for instance, uh, the 2.4 gigahertz to 0.485 gigahertz spectrum that is uh, available to it is divided into 11 channels at different frequencies, okay. And the um, access point administrator chooses a particular frequency for the access point. So interference is possible because that same channel could be used by um, some other neighboring access point. So we need to be careful about that. And what a host must do is, a host must associate with an access point. So how would it do that? It would normally scan the channels, you know, there have been, it knows that there are 11 channels at different frequencies. So it will scan these channels listening for what are called as beacon frames which contain the name of that access point, name or what we call as the um, SSID and some kind of an identifier and a MAC address. So once it gets this beacon frame and it identifies that there is a uh, access point available, 
it now will have to select one of those access points to associate with. Then it can form some, it can perform some kind of authentication mechanism. So, so that it will be able to connect to that. Once it is connected, it can run DHCP to get the IP address in that AP subnet, which that AP will be connected to some subnet. So, now this device will be able to get an IP address in that particular subnet. So, this is uh, what we expect to normally happen. So, when we talk about this scanning, right, there are two uh, modes of operation here. We talk about what is called as passive scanning and active scanning. So, in passive scanning, what happens is that when a node um, wants to connect, it waits to hear beacon frames from the access points. So, the first step here is the access points sending frames to this, uh, sending the frames, okay. So, beacon frames are coming from the access points, this is one. Now, second step will be, now on hearing these uh, beacon frames, by looking at either signal strength or, or whatever um, basis, the host H1 chooses which access point it wants to associate to and sends what is called as an association request frame. So, for instance, the H1 here may send a request frame to this access point here, right, so AP2. So, now what will happen when it sends this association request, that access point will send back a association response frame, right, saying that yes, you are now associated with me, right. So, that will be the third step. So, this is what is called as passive scanning because the host here is passive, passive with respect to the host. Host is really not doing anything specific, it is being passive. So, next is an active scanning mode. So, in the active scanning mode for what happens is that the host starts off looking for access points. So, what the host will first do is send out what is called as a probe request frame. So, it broadcasts this probe request frame, okay, sends it all over. So, all the APs which, which listen or which um, receive this probe request frame will send a probe response frame. So, you can see that host is broadcasting a probe request frame step 1, step 2 it receives the probe response frames from these. Now, out of these two it sends, it selects one uh, access point that it wants to connect to maybe based on um, again signal strength or whatever uh, reason and it sends an association request frame to that particular AP. Now, that again will send back an association response frame and the association gets completed, okay. So, this is, these are the two modes, passive mode and active mode for getting connected to the network as such, okay. So, now when we have multiple devices accessing the network, right. So, let us look at what are the other things that we need to deal with. So, one of the things that we need to deal with is when two or when more than two nodes are transmitting at the same time, we need to avoid collisions. So, how do we do that? So, first thing of course, we will do is we will do a CSMA technique which is very similar to what we have in Ethernet that is the CSMA part, the carrier sends multiple access that is you will sense the carrier before you transmit. So, there is already some transmission going on obviously, we do not want to transmit at that time, right. You do not want to collide with an ongoing transmission. So, you will sense the medium before you transmit. So, if you sense the media and then if you find that there is uh, no transmission then you could transmit. But the difficulty in 802.11 in a wireless network as such is that you cannot do collision detection as is done in the case of Ethernet. In Ethernet for instance, we do the same CSMA, but when we transmit, we do a collision detection. If uh, two people have transferred at the same time, we will detect the collision and you will be able to um, back off based on that. But in the case of wireless network, it becomes difficult to sense the collisions, okay. That is because again as we saw, it could be because of reasons like um, fading, right, the attenuation that is happening of the transmitted signals. Okay, and we also looked at the hidden terminal problems. You cannot sense all collisions, right? So it could be because of the hidden terminal problem or because of the attenuation of the signals. You cannot really see if A and A is transmitting while C is transmitting data. So you cannot hear A's transmission, right? So we need you, you cannot do collision detection. So we need to do something else. So what do we need to do? We do what is called as collision avoidance. So we have a technique called CSMA CA. The C for the collision, A for avoidance. So, how do we avoid the collisions? So, that is that is the important uh, part of the 802.11 protocol. So, what we do here is um, the idea that is used is that you would like to allow the sender to reserve the channel for some uh, amount of time rather than do a random access of the uh, channel, okay. So, you want to avoid collisions of long data frames. So, how do we do that? How can I reserve the channel? So, this reservation is done by means of what is called as sending a small packet okay, what is called as a request to send packet. So, the sender before it starts transmitting will send out first something called a RTS packet or a um, request to send packet using the CSMA mechanism that is the carrier sense multiple access mechanism. Now, RTS which are coming from two, now it's, you can always ask this question, right. So, there can be two uh, nodes which are sending RTS at the same time, so th those could collide. 
So, if they collide what will happen obviously, we have a collision again. So, what is done in that case is that um, you will again have to retransmit the RTS. So, that is something that which will have to be done, but our um, uh, the, um, the difference we have is that these RTS frames are very short. So, this collision will also be only for a very short period of time. Now, what happens when the RTS is sent is that the um, base station on receiving this will send a clear to send in response to the RTS that is the receiver will send a clear to send saying I am now willing to receive your data. Now, this RTS and CTS will consist of information which says that I am going to transmit to you for this much amount of time and the CTS will say yes you can transmit to me for this much amount of time. So, which means all the others who, who listen to the CTS will know that this particular sender is sending data to this receiver and all the others will defer their transmission for that particular duration of time. So, they would not interfere with that transmission right. So, in a way you can see we have reserved the channel by sending this special packet called the RTS packet and receiving the CTS packet as a response or an acknowledgement for that uh, RTS transmission ok. So, you avoid data frame uh, collisions completely using these small reservation packets that is the idea that is used ok. So, this is basically how it will work. So, let us say for instance A and B want to send um, data. So, this sends an RTS, this also sends an RTS, a, a collision could occur. So, a reservation collision occurs. Now, what will happen? Both A and B will not receive their CTS. So, they will wait for a random amount of time and after a random amount of time, one of them let us say sends an RTS. So, A sends an RTS. Now, when A sends an RTS, the access point will respond with the CTS. Now, access point's response will be heard by both A and B. So, now B will refrain from transmission and A can start its transmission. Now, A sends its data right and until the access point acknowledges that the uh, other stations B for instance in this case will defer transmission and it will try to access the, the uh, channel only after this, this point of time. So, you can see how the RTS CTS exchange helps to avoid the collision. So, this is the key technique that is used. So, no normally what we have is that we have this 802.11 sender um, which will uh, sense first the channel right and along with the RTS and CTS mechanism there is also another mode of the CSMA mode of operation that we said right. So, what happens in that mode is that the channel will first sense the uh, I mean the uh, resender will first sense the channel and he will normally wait for a certain amount of time what is called as the interframe space. We have different interframe spaces which are used to uh, space out the transmissions of different uh, users for different purposes. So, there is something called a DIFS a distributed interframe space a timing that is used by the sender for which he will wait before he will transmit the data ok. So, now he transmits the data and on receiving the data the receiver will wait for again a short um, IFS uh, amount of time before he sends back the acknowledgement ok. So, now if the, if the channel is sensed busy what is it that the sender would do? The sender would start off a random back off time and it will start off a timer which will keep counting down until the um, while the channel is idle and it will transmit and it will transmit when the timer expires ok. So, if there is no acknowledgement what does it indicate? It indicates again that some transmission some, something went wrong with the transmission. So, then it will have to um, repeat the transmission ok. So, that is what it will happen. So, this is the CSMA part of the transmission that is without the collision avoidance part ok. So, that is uh, what you will have to do over here. And 802.11 receiver it would uh, if the frame is received fine if it does not receive the frame right. Uh, if it, I mean if it has received the frame correctly it sends back an acknowledgement after waiting for this SAFS amount of time. Why do we need this ACK? Because we know that um, there could be hidden uh, terminal problems if when you are not using the RTS CTS mechanism. So, then we need to uh, handle this ok. So, we have the CSMA part and then we have the CA part. So, combine these two together and you get your CSMA CA mode of operation as such. So, now uh, when we talk of 802.11 it actually supports two modes of operation. One is called the DCF mode of operation other called the PCF mode of operation. DCF stands for distributed coordination function where it uses the CSMA CA approach which uses both the physical and the virtual carrier sense. Physical carrier sense is the CSMA that we talked about, virtual carrier sense is the RTS CTS uh, mode of operation that we talked about ok. Then we have a point coordination function where the um, so you can see that in DCF actually what happens is that it is a free for all anybody can transmit to uh, anybody at any point of time. So, it is a completely contention based mechanism of getting access to the channel. Now, in the point coordination function what we do is the uh, point coordinator typically which is the access point that access, access point acts as the arbitrator and determines who will actually get to transmit at a given point of time. So, what the access point will do is 
it tries to provide a contention free uh, mechanism of, of data transfer. So, it will poll the stations and let the st stations find and find out which are the stations that need to transmit and give the channel to those stations in order so that they can do the transmission. Okay. So, that is so we have these two modes of operation PCF mode the DCF mode and both these kind of uh, coexist in a in a given uh, 802.11 network. So, basically the way it is done is that if you look at uh, the complete data transfer what we call as a super frame structure for the data transfer you will find that some amount of there will be a beacon frame that is sent which is used to indicate the beginning of this particular uh, transmission period. Now, for this entire transmission period after the beacon frame there is something called a point coordination function time that is specified. So, this is a contention free period. Then there is a DCF transmission that is supported which is called as the contention period. Okay. So, normally the sequence will be like this. So, the PC first the point coordinator or the AP will send out a beacon frame to reserve the this contention free period. So, the, the duration for which, it want, for which it wants to access that will be first reserved by it. Then the stations will set their what is called as a network allocation vector to reserve that particular point coordination function for that particular time. Okay. Now, they will be able to transmit for that duration of time. After that the PCF will be followed by a DCF period where it is a contention based period. So, anybody who wants to transmit will first do go through the CSMA, CSMA CA mechanism and they will try to transmit the data. Okay. So, CFP repetition period. Uh, now, while the um, DCF transmission is going on if the CFP repetition period ends you cannot immediately start because something is happening right. So, if it is busy you will delay this period for a while and then once the transmission is over then you start the next CFP repetition period will start ok that is uh, basically how the DCF and PCF are used together. So, this basically tells you uh, how the DCF transmission takes place you checking whether the channel is busy you wait for interframe space you have a back off timer you generate a new back off time wait for the back off time start transmit ok if the ACK is received fine successful transmission otherwise you increment the number of attempts and if it is too many attempts you say that the uh, transmission has failed otherwise you go back and transmit the whole thing. So, this is what happens on the transmitter side. On the receiver side similarly you check whether the channel is active you start receiving if it is still active you continue receiving if the receiving frame is too small then you know that something is wrong. So, you go back to channel active if you recognize the address yes fine otherwise you go back again and then you check whether it is a valid uh, FCS if things that is your uh, if it is a valid frame then uh, if it is yes you continue send the acknowledgement and you are uh, uh, reception is successful otherwise you will have an error. So, you indicate that there is an error ok this is the uh, structure that we have in DCF. Now, coming to the frame structure this is another very important aspect of the 802.11 uh, frame of the uh, protocol. Now, if you look at the frame structure you will see that there is a frame control field a duration field and then you will see that there are four address fields address 1, address 2, address 3 and address 4. Now, normally you would have seen that in all the protocols that we have there will be two addresses the destination address and the source address, but here we have four address fields and then there is a sequence control field then of course, the payload and then the CRC ok. So, um, if you look at these four address fields we see why we need these four address fields. So, the address 1 is normally the MAC address of the wireless host or the AP which is to receive this frame ok. Address 2 is the MAC address of the wireless host or AP which is transmitting this frame. Now, the address 3 is the MAC address of the router interface to which this AP is attached. So, you remember that this AP will be attached to some could be attached to some router. So, in which case you may want to send a packet into the in to the network. So, which means you need to go through the router. So, to go to the router you have to go through the access point. So, from here you go through this through this access point to that particular router. So, that information can be specified here ok. And this address 4 is used only when you are in the ad hoc mode. So, this is typically used when you have an access point connected to another access point. So, you may have one device going from uh, one access points area to that access point AP 1 let us say from that to AP 2 and from AP 2 to the destination. So, you can see that there are four addresses that are required. So, that is that is where this fourth address will come into play. Otherwise, if you are connected to a router this access point is connected to a router this is the third address that we will need ok. So, this is the purpose of the three addresses that we have over here. So, you can see how the addressing will be. Um, so, this um, when your H1 is connecting to the access point address 1 will have the AP uh, MAC address that is the destination H1 MAC address is the source and the third address will have the R1 MAC address. Now, when when this access pointing sending it to the router it will it may be now sending it as an 802.3 frame this may be an ethernet network right. So, in which case 
R, so it will take this R1 MAC address, put as a destination address, use this H1 MAC address as the source address and send it over here. Okay. So you can see how this information will be used by the access point to forward it to the router. Okay. This is the important aspect of the addressing mechanism that we need to remember. Okay. And if you look at this frame control field in the um, in the in the format, there is a lot of inf information that we have over here. There is something called a type field. This type is used to indicate whether it is an RTS field, RTS packet or a CTS packet or an ACT packet or a data packet. And the duration here, uh, this is the duration for which the channel is being reserved, okay. That is used when you have an RTS, CTS uh, packet that is being sent, okay. And then there are few other fields that we have, we have which are used for power management, more data for uh, security purposes and so on. So many other fields are also used over here. Now there are also certain advanced capabilities that 802.11 supports. We will quickly look at just one or two of them. Um, one is rate adaptation. That is, we said that if a mobile is um, moving away and its um, bit error rate, for instance, is uh, not acceptable, so it may move to a different transmission rate. So, an example is what we can have, we can see over here. So, you can see that, for instance, here uh, it may be moving away, so its SNR decreases, right? You can see that SNR is decreasing. So, when the when it decreases, what it could do is it could switch to a different. Um, uh, transmission mechanism at the physical uh, layer, right. So, in which case now the bit error, so you switch to a different one and use this particular uh, transmission mechanism and choose the one that and you will be at an acceptable bit error rate when you move to a different uh, transmission mechanism or when I say transmission mechanism what I am essentially meaning is that you can use some other modulation technique. So, we have QAM 256, QAM 16 and so on, right. So, you may move to a lower rate modulation technique and be able to still provide the service. So, this is one technique that is normally now provided on many of the 802.11 devices and networks. So, another capability that is also provided is for power management. So, here what normally a node can tell the AP is that I am going to sleep until the next beacon frame. So, which means the AP should not send any transmit frames, any frames to this particular node until the next beacon frame. So, when the next beacon frame comes, the node will wake up automatically and it will be able to receive the data. So, the beacon frame will contain the list of mobiles with the AP to mobile frames which are waiting to be sent, right. So, it will say these are the ones who are waiting for the data to be sent. So, the node will stay awake if there is a frame that is um, that is um, that is meant for it, that is there is some, some frame which is to be sent to it. Otherwise, it can sleep again until the next beacon frame. So, this way the devices can reduce the power consumption, okay, they can do the power management. So, this is also something which is now provided in 802.11. So, to summarize what we have looked at with respect to 802.11 are the following, we looked at the characteristics of wireless networks, we looked at the CSMA, CA mechanism, we looked at PCF and DCF modes of operation, frame formats and different capabilities. Thank you.